Hey girl. Hello friends, welcome back. I am Jason and today we're talking all about tips and tricks. Things that will save you time, save you energy, and potentially save your life. Caching gear is always a good idea. You can only carry so much crap on your back. And if you know that you're frequenting areas from time to time and you're going to be there on a semi-regular basis, there's nothing really wrong with stashing a little bit of stuff here and there. This is a bow drill set that I stuck inside of a hollowed out tree. I think it got a little bit wet in, my la in the last rainstorm, so I should have probably done a little bit better job, but I think you guys get the idea. I could have come back to this location at a later date, potentially tapped into that, and used it. Now, a bow drill set probably, you know, isn't the most realistic and practical, but, you know, a lighter, perhaps a tarp, some spare clothing, I don't know. But caching gear has been a thing for centuries, millennia. People have stowed away important gear along their regular routes for thousands of years, and it has saved a lot of lives, and it has come in really, really handy. This little spring right here comes out of the earth right up there where Maggie is, if you see her. The water's coming out of the earth right there. Um, and now this spring typically flows pretty regular, but it's been very, very dry here. So what I'm getting at is don't completely 100% rely on all of your water sources being where you planned on them being, unless it's, you know, a, a big body of water, like a big river or something, you know. You need to refill your water bottles. Do that when you have the water, when you see it, when you've got your water source. Fill up your belly first, because that's the best water bottle that you can fill up. Drink your fill, right, if you're on the move especially. Drink your fill as much as you can tolerate without making yourself sick. And then fill up all your canteens when you have that water source, because there's been a lot of situations where people have been really counting on that next watering hole to supply them with the water that they needed, and they ignored one that they just went past, and then they ended up getting there and there'd be nothing. So if water is, is, is crucial and at a premium where you are, make sure that you are stocking up when you find it. Maggie here is waiting for you to hit the thumbs up, subscribe, notifications bell is always nice, but she's not too picky. As long as you do one of those, she'll be happy. Stay, girl. Stay. So there's some deer right there. Let's say you do see your target, you do see your prey, and it's a deer and it's walking, it's on the move, and you want it to stop so you can get a good shot at it. Oh, there they go. Stay. Stay, Maggie. And you wanted to get a good shot at it. If it was on the move and it wasn't aware of your presence, what you could do that's been successful for me is just making that sound right there. Meh. <laughs> and the deer will generally stop and look and see what that sound was. And that's when you can take your shot. Maggie would love to chase those deer, wouldn't you girl? Huh, Maggie? You'd like to chase those deer? Yeah. She loves running after the deer. She never catches them. She got chased by a deer one time, actually. She was, she she ran after a deer that was in the yard in uh, the, big, the big field in front of the house. And she went, she went running after it and then quickly came high tailing actually low tail and she had her tail between her legs and her butt was off really close to the ground and she was running as fast as she could to get away from mama deer that was trying to stomp her. <laughs> I generally speaking don't like having stuff lashed to the outside of my backpack for quite a few reasons, but primarily is because I don't want to lose it. I have definitely lost quite a few things like camera tripods and stuff like that from having them strapped to the outside of my pack. And then you just realize, you get there, wherever you're ending up, you're supposed to be going and you realize that you don't have what you need. Now, one exception that I will make to that rule is this Thermarest right here. I like these really simple, really reliable, comfortable Thermarests like this one. I will strap this to my pack. I've never lost this with these compression straps that come around the front side of my pack. It's, it's never fallen off. It's always been really secure. But like a saw, for example, like this one. Hey, girl. A saw like this one. Watch out, girl. 
like this one, I would not want to trust just having, you know, dangling on the outside, even if it's stuck down in a pocket like that. And even if those compression straps are over the outside of it, I'd want to make sure that I've got it dummy corded in some way. And what I generally do, this is a piece of paracord that I've got through there. I don't use the paracord for anything other than just kind of hanging up the saw on a, on a nail or something, or sticking that compression strap through there. So even if this was to fall out of here, it would stay connected and I wouldn't lose this thing. So important pieces of gear like a saw and things of that nature, or really anything, anything you try to lash to the outside of your pack, make sure you've got it dummy corded in some form or fashion. Yeah, it's a good dog. Yeah. Good girl. Everything is soaking wet and I don't like to put my pack on the ground because it's going to soak up that moisture and I'm going to have to dry it out later and all that. Even though I've treated my pack with wax, it's still going to soak up a little bit of water and I just want to keep my stuff dry, keep it light. The wetter the thing gets, the heavier it gets too. So keep that in mind. So what I'll do typically is I'll just kind of set it on top of my thermarest like this and then lean it up against a tree so it doesn't fall over. That works quite well. Or you can find yourself just a small branch like this. Cut that end off just take your pack and you hang it from a tree like that and that works fantastic if it's not currently raining keeping your stuff dry what you're thinking to yourself is what if it is raining what do you do lots of different things you can have all your stuff in dry bags inside of your pack you can have a waterproof pack there's lots of different tactics to keep your equipment dry inside of your pack but one that I like to use is just using my poncho. So if I'm not active, if I'm not wearing my poncho, let's say I'm in my shelter and I have my pack outside of my shelter for some reason and I want to keep it dry. What I would do is go ahead and pull out my poncho. Again, if I'm not wearing it as my shelter, I've got another tarp or I'm in my tent or whatever. My makeshift shelter of some sort. Reach my hand down through the hood of my poncho like this i'll grab the top grab handle of my pack like so pull the poncho over just like that and i'll end up with this right here and that can be hung from that same branch and on the branch by the by the grab handle on the top of the pack and then i'll put the hood right over top of that. And then I could pull the drawstring nice and tight, cinch it down, and that will close up that hole. And there's gonna be some water running down the tree when it's raining really hard, but this, for the most part, if you tuck it in really good, kind of wrap that hood around there and you've drawn it up really good, you can even wrap, you can even wrap this around if you're really concerned about it. I've used this method really successfully quite a few times because oftentimes I'm traveling really, really light and my shelter is quite small. And oftentimes there's not a lot of room in there for extra gear. And if I can put that gear on the outside somewhere and still manage to keep all my equipment dry, you're good to go. But again, I still recommend keeping anything that really needs to stay dry in some sort of dry bag inside of your pack that's been treated to stay dry as well. I like these for a lot of reasons over the inflatable type mattresses. They're easier to set up much faster and they're really, really, really reliable. The Inflatable ones are the most comfortable night sleep that you're gonna have outside of sleeping in a hammock. A hammock is really comfortable, but if you're gonna be sleeping on the ground, the inflatable mattresses, are, it doesn't get much more comfortable than that. Reliability of these is why I like them so much. I generally cut mine smaller. I only make them from about my shoulder to knee length. I get rid of the excess material on them that's not really that necessary and it makes it a much smaller package and easier for you to carry around. While they weigh almost nothing, they do take up quite a bit of space, especially if you don't get rid of those extra few folds on there. Actively raining right now, and I don't feel like setting up my camp. I just don't wanna mess around with all that stuff. What I'll do is I will open up this, this sleep pad. You can do this against a tree if you want, but generally what I do, what I'll do is I'll just put it up against a hill. Just a hill right here, the bottom bottom of a hill, it kind of slopes right this, kind of like a lazy boy 
lounge chair. Then I will drape. You can take your pack off if you want, but sometimes, sometimes leaving your pack on makes it more comfortable. It gives you something to lean up against. Or you can take your pack up and use it kind of a pillow. If your pack is really tall, you've got a large pack, you can kind of just lean your head up against it. But drape the poncho over your legs like this, tuck yourself in against a hill, and you can just fall right asleep. The simplest, easiest shelter that you'll ever set up. And this is one of the reasons why I just love ponchos so much is because I can do this while everybody else is scrambling around trying to set up their silly tents with all their guy lines and all that stuff. I could just do this <laughs> and be asleep before they're even close to setting up. And maybe you might sleep better in some sort of fancier rig. And generally speaking, what I'll do is I'll set up a, uh, a hammock or, or something similar or some sort of tarp at least over top. But if you're pressed for time or just wore out, hard to beat this. Like I said, you could do this up against a tree if you want, but I found the hill, a hill like this, if you could find one, some sort of uh, steep little spot like this, this is much more comfortable than leaning up against a tree. It's hard to find a tree with the, the right angle for reclining, if you know what I mean. Hey, Maggie, come on. Come on, Maggie, yeah. You can invite your four-legged friend into your shelter as well. And if it's cold, come here, Maggie. Come on. I've done videos in the past where I've put candles underneath a sheltered like this. You just get in your poncho and, and hang out, light the candle in there, and it makes a big difference. I can't remember what it was, but like 10, 20 degrees difference from the inside temperature to the out. But if you got a friend, a little buddy heater like that under your poncho, it would work probably just as well, uh, maybe, maybe even better actually. It's getting darker and darker. I think it is going to rain on me here in just a second. We might have to hang out under our poncho for a few minutes, won't we? I'm about to show you the easiest way to attach a piece of cordage around a tree. If you know how to tie your shoes, you know how to do this. So start by going around the tree, obviously, and then starting, just like you tie your shoes, cross the line over itself and pull it tight, just like that. Pull it nice and snug. It doesn't have to be crazy tight. And then what you'll do Instead of making double bunny ears, you just make a single. So you go around that main portion of your line, you tuck some of it through, and you pull it tight, and it creates a loop, just like that. It's key not to let that tag end right there go all the way through. And that right there is a very secure knot, and you can cinch it up onto the tree, and you could put tons of force on that. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna pull really hard I am leaning against this knot. I'm putting all my weight against it and pulling hard. And that very, very simple knot does not come undone. That <laughs> does not come undone. But if you want it to come undone, all you do is pull the tag end and it comes free just like that. So again, what you do is go around the tree. You start just by like you would tie in your shoes. You cross the line over itself, pull it tight, and then make yourself a small little loop Pull it tight, like that. Snug it up against the tree. Give it a good tug. You can cinch it up against the tree if you like, and that is going nowhere. Now, let's say you were worried about it going somewhere, right? What you could do is take a stick like this, pull that tag in like that, and now there's absolutely no way that that can come undone. That just makes it harder to get untied, though, when you do that. So I generally don't do that. Oh, trying to make it to that tree and what do you know our ridge line is just a little bit too short what can we do i generally keep small pieces of cordage like this in my pocket i keep it in my pack you know 10 15 20 feet anything over about 25 feet of cordage tends to be a little bit unwieldy and unmanageable so having the shorter pieces and really generally speaking you don't need anything longer than this right here so but let's say for some reason you do need a longer line for some reason you just take a little bit extra right here and then you create two loops and you'll connect those loops together is just to make a bite in the rope like this so i just turn it over like that and it's called making a bite double it up i'll do the same thing on this side on this piece of cordage i'll put the long line right here that's attached to my tree through the short piece of cordage like that so i insert it through 
And then I'll take both here, both these lines right here, and I'll run it through. I'll run it through that loop and I'll pull the entire length of cordage through, just like that. And I'll pull it down tight. Do you see that? Right there? Creates that right there. I did nothing else. I did not tie any knots, no hard knots, nothing like that. They're just loose ends of the cordage. Look, nothing, that's it. And the friction of the line itself is crazy strong. That does not come undone very easily at all. But when I wanna get it undone, all I gotta do is break that right there. So I'll push right here on this portion of the line like that, and that loosens everything up. And then I can undo the whole thing, just like that. So no hard knots need to be tied. Different kinds of cordages, you, your results may vary, but with paracord, you don't have to do anything else. And now I can reach that tree that I was trying to get to and tie it off in any form or fashion that you'd like. I guess I've got to go ahead and show you how I would do that. So I'd wrap around the tree. I could pull it really good and tight. Lots of tension on there. And then I can wrap around the line, the main line, and then go back around the tree. Like, and then I go back around the tree like so and then i can just half hitch it off right like there's a single half hitch if i wanted to do another what i would typically do is the loop here like that and that would hold my line very very tight very very secure you can do truckers hitches and all that kind of stuff that's that works really good and i do that quite a bit but this one is actually probably the knot that i use the most so and then when i untie it pull that loose undo the half hitch and then everything comes undone maybe you're curious on how i store my cordage lots of different ways to do this this is just how i do it lots of ways to skin this cat i'll pinch it between my index finger and my thumb and I'll wrap, depending on how long the cordage is, this is a fairly short piece. I'll just go around three fingers. I'll spread my three fingers apart and I'll go around and around and around until I get close to the end. And once I get close to the end like this, I'll just take my cordage, I'll bunch it up, I'll give it a little twist and I'll grab right there in the middle. And then I take this remainder of the cordage and I wrap around it, kind of stacking the wraps on top of each other, just like that. And then when I get close to the end, of my cordage i'll go over top of my thumb and then in that space that i've created between my thumb and the rest of the cordage i'll stick that tag in through there just like that and snug it tight Let's say that I've neglected my poor knife here like I have. It's a little bit rusty. Yeah, it's dull in some areas, especially right here at that, the end of the blade where it curves up towards the tip. That gets beat up quite a bit from just dragging it across things, cutting through materials and things like that. So it needs a little bit of love, but let's say I have forgotten my knife sharpener. What I can do is I can use the back of my saw right here, or the back of a machete, or the back of another knife, doesn't really matter. It's It works really, really good for just honing up a blade, touching up a blade. If it's really far gone and it needs some material removed, this isn't going to work very good. But if you just need to touch it up a bit, like for example, like my knife probably won't shave my, yeah, it won't shave any hair off my arm right now. But what I'll do is I'll touch it up on the back of my saw, just like this. That's what, this is one of the reasons why I like a convex edge knife like the one here. It's because it's just, for me, it's just easier to sharpen than like a Scandinavian grind. It doesn't, doesn't have, you don't have to be so precise with it. But I'll just find the right angle. I'll look at the edge of my blade and I'll find the right angle. I'll close up that space until I get right there on the cutting edge. And then I'll drag it across the back of this smooth saw blade right here. I'll go towards myself about 10 times and then I'll go away from myself about 10 times. And I'll do that a few times, back and forth, switching it up. And 
maybe I'd say 50 strokes, give or take on each side, is probably gonna be sufficient for most, most of the time, just for touching your blade up. Doesn't take but a second. And let's see if we've made any improvements. Not sure if you can see that, but now we're shaving sharp. Look at that. And that's all I had was the back of my saw to touch up my knife. People will try to convince you that you need all these things, these special apparatuses, apparati. I don't know, I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> the special apparati to sharpen your knife. And while some of those things are really beneficial, and for the professional knife wielder out there, I guess it may be a thing, but for me, stuff like this, just, it's good enough, gets the job done. And that is one word, by the way, good enough. That's a good girl. I don't know if you knew this, guys. It's been a, it's been a couple years, I guess, now, but Maggie is famous. She was on a TV show on National Geographic called, uh, Called to the Wild. Call of the Wild? No, Called to the Wild. So we were on a TV show where we spent 10 days in, in the remote wilderness of Maine. And we had some supplies and gear with us, you know, had not a whole lot more than what I'm carrying with me right now. The whole goal of the show was to include your dog in as many of the tasks that needed to be done as possible. So for, from everything from shelter building to fire starting and all that stuff. And while it was kind of silly, some of it, you know, is because it's just kind of far-fetched. Like I had Maggie drag some firewood for me, you know. She's a little dog. I mean, how much firewood, I mean, it would just be easier for me to do it myself than try to rig her up to some harness-like thing. But anyway, it was really fun. It was challenging in the fact that you had to not only do all the survival skills, but you had to figure out how to get your dog to do those. So I really enjoyed it and it was fun having Maggie out there in the woods with me. If you haven't seen that that show, check it out. Called to the Wild on Nat Geo. I think it's on Disney Plus now. It's, it's out there and about. I, I am on episode, I forget what number, I want to say five. It's called... Uh, Dog Gone, I believe is what it's called. Dog Gone is the name of my episode. So check that out. See Maggie in action. We had a good time. While we were on that show, Maggie slept in my sleeping bag. She had her own down blanket, downfield blanket. Very comfortable, but she chose to crawl in my sleeping bag every single night. With a good sharp knife, I cut this branch off of a tree, and now I've got a fairly sharp point that's going to make my tent stake. I want about, you know, and say an eight inch tent stake, something like that, give or take. So what I'm gonna do to save myself some time and be more efficient when I make things is I'm gonna measure about eight inches, which is about that span right there. And then I'm going to double it. I'm gonna double that distance on that stake. And then I'm gonna cut it right here. Again, with one good push, I've got another sharp-ish point on my stake and what I want to do now is cut this thing right in the middle and that's going to give me two tent stakes so I'll just beaver chew my way around snappity snap and one slice and now I've got two tent stakes of a pretty much the same size if you need to if these need to be hammered into the ground which here, they don't. But if they needed to be hammered into the ground, what I would do is I would bevel these off. They would look more, they would look more like this if I needed to hammer them into the ground. And I could tune up my point a little bit if I chose to. You don't want them really sharp because then they're just gonna blunt up the ends and smash them into rocks and stuff like that and they're gonna get dull. So something kind of like that, a fairly blunt but effective enough point. You don't want to make them like a pencil. You don't want them to look like a pencil because a lot of times wood will have, not this, this is a maple, so this would be fine, but a lot of woods have kind of a pithy center, a soft, spongy-like center. So let's say I sharpen this one like a pencil, and this is a hardwood, a maple, and it's not really that big a deal, but a lot of woods have a soft, pithy center, and this middle part right here would be very spongy, and it would get dull and it wouldn't work really good. So sharpening off to one side like that works quite well and it makes a more durable point on most kinds of wood. Now to set up probably the easiest shelter to set up with a poncho or any kind of tarp really, a small tarp, a big tarp will be a little bit more challenging to do this with because you have to deal with kind of the center sagging. But with a small tarp, 
All you do is pull the drawstring, or a poncho, you'd pull the drawstring tight, close up that hole where your head would go, give it a twist below where the drawstring is, give it a twist, turn it over, give it a gooseneck like that, and then you just wrap that around a few times. And just like we dealt with our hank of cordage, on the last wrap or two, I'll just go over top of my thumb, and then I'll stick this remainder of the cordage through, pull it tight, and that's gonna keep any water coming through the hood. If you're using store-bought steaks, they'll fit right through the grommets of your poncho, no problem. But if you're making steaks, sometimes they'll, they'll be too big to fit through those grommets. And that's why I suggest putting short pieces of cordage like this bank line on the corners of your tarps, just to make it easier to tie them out, stake them out. So but what I'll do to attach the first corner to my tree is I'll just take my piece of cordage, my piece of paracord like that, and I'll just run it through that grommet, just like that. And I'll run it kind of to the middle of the tree or run it to the middle of the string just like that and then like i said before if you know how to tie your shoes then this is going to be no problem i'll go about i don't know say sternum hot the bottom the xiphoid process right here bottom of your sternum is about where i'll go i'll wrap around the tree and then i'll just tie my shoes i don't even need to show you guys how to do this you know how to tie your shoes you cross the line of yourself make the double bunny ears shoes have been tied you get it and that's gonna hold one corner of my poncho or my tarp very, very securely. And then I'll just stake out the three corners, but it's key, make sure you stake out the furthest corner first. I'll just stake it out. So I've got my corner of my tarp here. I've got this extra cordage if I should need it. Some of these are small enough where they probably would fit through the grommets, but I'll just use the cordage. Just go around it like that. You can make it fancy if you'd like. You can do kind of, um, uh, what do you call that? A girth hitch like this double it over, stick your your stake through, and that pulls it tight, and that's really, really secure, but not generally necessary. And then you'll stab it in the ground at about 45 degrees towards the tree that you tied the one corner, the farthest corner. Not crazy tight where you're gonna damage your poncho, but tight enough where when you stake it in the ground, it still stays taut. So 45 degrees going towards my shelter, towards my tree, Stick that in the ground. The ground is soft enough here where I don't have to hammer it in the ground, but I could, like that. And then we use our two more stakes to stake out the other two corners. my bed roll, my inflatable pad, my thermarest, whatever it is, and then crawl inside and I'm good to go. This is gonna keep the majority of the rain off me. I could take a piece of cordage and I can tie it here and lift this up. And that gives me a lot more room inside of my shelter and would also help shed the rain a little better. And this isn't gonna catch any rainwater. It's a little saggy right here, but it's steep enough where the, all that water is gonna flow off of it, no problem. It's not gonna, it's not gonna puddle up on you and, and end up dripping on you and getting you wet. It's still, I've slept under it just like this plenty of times and had no issues. I could take a piece of cordage and I could tie it up to this tree right here that's close to it or an overhanging branch or whatever. I could string a ridge line over top if I needed to, if there weren't any close branches, that would work too. Sometimes there's some, there's things close enough where you can just use this and hook over. In this situation, what I would probably do is just grab that right there. Yeah, that works. And then Maggie and I can crawl in here under our shelter and stay out of the elements. Um, if she wasn't with me, there'd be a little bit of room here for other gear perhaps, or even a little bit of firewood, and that would keep my firewood dry. I could have a fire a few few feet away, maybe three, four feet is about as far or as close as I want to get because you'd get embers melting holes in your poncho. And that's why I've got patches all over this one. I would typically use my pack for a pillow of sorts. I mean, a pillow is, it's hard for me to sleep comfortably without a pillow of some sort. I mean, I'll even, I've even used a rock and a log. I'll sleep on my side kind of curled up and have something underneath my head. Right, girl? But I love, I love this simple shelter. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is the, the first shelter that I'll teach pretty much anybody especially kids because they already know how to tie their shoes. 
it's very simple. You don't even have to carve these stakes. You can, one, you can bring them, which is easier, or you can pick up any stick. Unless you live in a place where the ground is really hard, you could pick up any stick and stab it into the ground. So it's a really good shelter to teach little kids, young kids, that can be set up really fast, really simply. And it's a piece of kit that a lot of people already have. I was hoping it'd rain on us so you guys could see this in action a little bit. It looks like it's gonna rain any second now and it's sprinkling but it hasn't came a deluge yet. But in a shelter like this, you're, you're gonna stay mostly dry. Uh, I'd, it'd be a lie to say that you're gonna be 100% completely dry under a small little tarp like this. It's just, you're gonna get some, in a hard, hard rain, you're gonna get some splash back and you're gonna get a little damp in some places, right? That's why clothing is super important. Having the right clothing, such as wool, like this, I think is a really, really big deal. I don't always wear wool. I don't wear wool every single day of my life. But when I'm going into a remote setting, I would I would pretty much, not always, but I like to wear wool whenever I can because it insulates even when it is wet. And it dries pretty fast, too. and doesn't stink. So I like that. But, um, yeah, you might get a little bit of splashing here and there off the sides and stuff like that. Or if the wind is blowing. I, I like this set up really a lot because even if it is windy it's not it's only open on these two sides right here it's closed down on the other two sides for the most part and that'll keep most of the elements off of you and you can always change the direction depending on the predominant wind if the wind is coming in this way and it's just blowing in all i'd have to do is is tie up the other side tie up the far corner there and it would reverse it and protect me a little bit more And this shelter combined with a bivy bag, like this super lightweight SOL breathable bivy, the escape, SOL escape bivy. Combined with this, if I crawled inside of this thing, right now it's too dang hot. I, would, <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting wet right now, but, but I could crawl in this thing tonight and if it started to come raining on me, it wouldn't even matter. The little bit of drips and splashes and stuff that might come in here and might sneak around the sides of my shelter. If I'm wrapped up in this thing, wouldn't even matter. We'd be dry, no problems. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. I cannot wait to see you on the next one. Make sure you're leaving a comment for us. Any comment will do. Tell me what you think about this shelter. Tell me what your favorite movie is. I don't care. As long as you leave some sort of comment, that'd be very much appreciated. Thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't done so already. Can't wait to see you on the next one.